In this video, I'd like to give you an intuitive understanding of something called Green's Theorem. If you didn't guess already, Green's Theorem is this weird looking thing with a bunch of integrals over here. Um, so to start off with, I'm going to assume that you already know what a vector field is and how to take partial derivatives. But if you don't, I highly recommend that you check out my article on uh, back on our website. I'll link to it in the description below. So to start off with, let's say I have some vector field and vector field is basically, you know, a vector at every point in space, which is described by some function. So I'm just going to draw a bunch of random vectors here. I don't know. This could be a vector field, right? And what I want to know is given some string, right? Let's just say I place a string in this vector field and let's just say this vector field corresponds to, I don't know, force or velocity, but just keep it general for now. And, um, Let's say I, I place a string in it, right? Let's say I take this piece of string and I loop it onto itself and I just sort of plop it into the vector field. What I want to know is how much does our vector field tend to rotate the string? What I mean by rotate the string is not like swirling it around, but actually making it move like this in sort of this direction, in the direction of the string itself, right? I want to figure out how much does our vector field sort of spin this uh, piece of loop of string around about an axis, right? Which is popping um, out of the screen. So to start off with, what I'd like to do is sort of zoom in onto one tiny fragment of this string over here. Um, let's say it looks something like that. And to sort of get a notion of this type of rotation uh, throughout the entire loop of string, what I'm gonna do first is say, Let's say we have a small tangent vector that's popping out of the surface of the string, right? There's this little uh, tangent vector to the string. So it's tangent to the loop of the string, as you can see. And what I want to do is take the dot product of that little vector with the vector that's coming from my vector field, right? So the vector which I've drawn over here is sort of coming from F. So I'll label it like that. And how does this give you a sense of rotation? Well, you can imagine that if F is pointing like directly outward and is completely orthogonal to our um, tangent vector over here, then our vector field wouldn't rotate the string at all. It would sort of just push out on it and make it grow. So it would do something like that. It would be pushing out against our little piece of string and it won't be rotating it. Therefore, if you have our, uh, you know, vector field actually in the direction of the tangent vector, then it has a tendency to actually rotate um, this piece of string around. But finding it at one point really isn't enough. What I really need to do is add up all of these little bits of rotation across the entire loop of string. And that is what this integral over here represents. So if I write that down, I get that and I'm using this uh, little circle around the integral to denote that it's a integral over a closed loop. The dot product of our vector field with this little piece of string, uh, little vector that's tangent to the piece of string, sorry. So that's this ds vector over here. I'm going to label that, right? So this is what we want to compute. And this integrated over the entire loop of the string is going to give us a sense of rotation. So this, well, what is it equal to? So first I'm going to write out the integral symbol. Nothing changes over there. And what is F, right? What is our vector field? Well, our vector field F, I'm just going to write it on the side here, can be represented in terms of its individual X and Y components, which I'm going to label P and Q. So what are P and Q? P and Q are functions of both X and Y. So if I plot out what F might look like again, I have at some X and Y, right? I have some vector sticking out and the X component of that vector is going to be P and the Y component of that vector is going to be Q. So that's how our vector field is described and sort of abusing the notation over here a little bit, I'm just gonna write down um, the integral with the vector components, right? Um, and what is ds? Well, ds is basically the sum of the individual 
dx and dy's. So I can write that too. So ds is basically the vector whose x component is dx and whose y component is dy, right? And uh, you could probably work this out on your own and um, see how this vector actually does correspond to the tangent vector to our uh, little loop of string over here. So actually doing the dot product, I get the integral over the closed loop of p dot dx, I mean sorry, p multiplied by dx, and then I add that to q times dy. And there you go, you have an expression for rotation, which is great, honestly, because now you can actually, you know, given some p and given some q, you can actually carry out this integral and figure it out. Um, you can figure out, you know, how this vector field specified by p and q has a tendency to rotate the string around. But there's actually another way of computing um, the rotation, and it's probably a little bit more straightforward. So if you think about it, right, you have some uh, loop of string, but this time we're not gonna visualize it as a loop of string. We're gonna think of it as a conveyor belt, like the ones you see in an airport. So at the conveyor belt, we have a bunch of little motors over here that are sort of spinning this whole thing around, right? They're spinning the system around. So all these little motors together are working together to contribute to the entire rotation of uh, the conveyor belt. But what happens if I place another motor in the center? So it's not really sticking on to the edge, but I just place it in the center, right? What's going on? That little motor isn't going to contribute at all. This could be spinning however fast it wants to be, but it's not going to contribute to the total rotation of the conveyor belt since it's not touching the edge over there, right? So how do I represent the total rotation that's going on over here? Well, I represent that as the sum, and I use a double integral to sum over the entire surface over here. So I'm gonna call the surface S, right? Little bold over there. And what I'm going to do is sum over the surface, but what am I going to sum? I'm gonna sum up the little bits of rotation. And um, you could probably check this out, but the individual, the local rotation is given by something called the curl of the vector field, which is represented by del cross f, right? And if you actually go out and uh, compute this, what you get is the total amount of rotation across this entire surface. That is what this integral is giving over here. Okay, now here's the big moment. We can see that this expression over here does give us a sense of rotation, but so does this one. So what does that tell you? It's pretty straightforward. You can equate the two, right? So I'm just gonna write it down right now. Um, this is exactly what we've derived. Um, P dx plus Q dy, and that is going to equal to the same thing as summing over the, sur or sorry, integrating over the surface, del cross f. And that is Green's theorem, but there's, there's, you know, there's a small little thing that you probably might have noticed. You can't really take the cross product in uh, two dimensions. You need three dimensions to take the cross product because, you know, the third vector is going to be orthogonal and all that. So that, that's why, you know, when you write out this theorem in, um, two dimensions, you end up with this expression, which kind of does look like um, the curl of a vector field. You can think of it as the curl definition for two dimensions. And uh, you can think of my del cross F as sort of representing always the curl of the vector field and not actually being a cross product. But those little technical issues aside, this is pretty beautiful. I mean, and it's really quite simple, which is what really surprised me. This weird multivariable integral stuff all simplifies to essentially the problem of the conveyor belt. When you have a conveyor belt spinning, all this, this whole theorem is telling you that the sum of rotations across the entire surface is the same as the individual little pushing factors across the edge of the surface. And that makes sense because like I said, you can put a motor inside and you can spin it as fast as you want, but it's not going to contribute to the rotation of this entire string slash conveyor belt or whatever else you might want to think of it as. And that is Green's theorem.